All right, everybody, really happy to see all of you here today. Thank you for coming on over and spending a little time with us. My name is Denise Tenard, and I'm a volunteer with the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Cruz and Monterey County. And um, we are going to be having a fabulous class today on fall veggie gardening basics. Uh, before we get started, you know, all the usual Zoom uh, etiquette and uh, kind of protocols that we generally know about now, but uh, please double check that your microphone is muted. And um, we ask you also to uh, turn your video off, just minimize those distractions and help the presentation run really smoothly. Uh, for your best experience, uh, we recommend you might very well like the speaker view. Um, and if you have any technical questions, I'll be happy to help you with those. You can just go ahead and message me in the chat and I'll get you up and on running on track there. Uh, the live transcript uh, feature is enabled for this uh, presentation and there's a link to that at the bottom. You can see real-time closed captioning right down there if you'd like uh, to have that in addition to listening to us. Uh, anytime during the program, feel free to submit questions in the chat and we'll answer them all in the Q&A section at, uh, excuse me, the Q&A session after the presentation. Uh, as you may have heard, this event is being recorded and uh, you'll receive a link to the recording within just a few days after the class. So a little bit about us as Master Gardeners, uh, for those who might not know, um, we're a program uh, connected with the University of California. We've been around for about 40 years now. All volunteers working in partnership with the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division at UC. Uh, we all receive comprehensive training and provide outreach and research-based education on horticulture, pest management, and sustainable practices for home gardeners in our local communities. And now that you know a little bit about us, I'll go ahead and turn this over to our speakers for today. Elise and Bridget. All right, thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm Delise Weir and I'm Old as Dirt. Uh, 40 years of growing experience with food, flowers, and herbs primarily. I used to work for Renee's, Renee Shepherd's Seed Company. Uh, I have an environmental studies degree and I'm now a master gardener and I just really love to teach. Come on into the <laughs> screen here, Bridget. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. I'm Bridget and I am a master gardener and a master composter. I've been growing veggies and flowers for quite some time. And um, I also spent some time up at the UC SC Farm and Garden as an apprentice in a second year. And um, I also love to teach. So hopefully we've got some great um, things to share with you today. So what you can expect to get out of today's class, you will get uh, basic knowledge of how to begin fall gardening um, for vegetables, how to succeed with uh, different crops and when to plant them and how to plant them. And then also how to get a jump on your spring garden so that um, some winter soil management tips that will help you improve your level of effort in the spring when it's time to plant again. So fall gardening, why is it different than summer gardening? Isn't it kind of the same thing? Well, maybe not. The days are shorter and the sun is at an angle, so it's weaker and it's throwing longer shadows. So light and heat are always an issue. Of course, it's colder during the day, but mo more importantly at night when it gets really cold and there's always a potential for frost depending on where you live. Um, it's gonna rain, right? Hopefully. <laughs> And there's wind, so there's all kinds of weather conditions that we don't have in the summer. And then uh, one thing to think about always when you're fall, fall gardening is you, your plants are moving towards dormancy. When they get into December and January, they kind of slow down to almost a stop. So in the spring, when you plant something in the ground, it gets warmer and the days get longer and it just pops out of the ground. And it's just very easy to be successful. In the fall, it's a little trickier and the timing's a little more dependent. Um, here is just a tip. We've sprinkled tips here and there in this presentation, and you will get the presentation after, after the meeting a day or two later. Um, but there are frost blankets. There are two kinds of coverings that look similar, but one is thicker than the other. 
So a thick um, uh, frost blanket is a couple of mils thick. It still lets light through, but it doesn't let water through. Then there's something called a row cover, which we'll talk about when we get into the pest management side. And that is a much lighter piece of fabric and you can water right through it. So the frost blankets are good to protect tender plants before the frost. And it's tricky to know when it's gonna frost or not. You just gotta keep your eye on the weather report. So selecting your site for your fall garden might be a little different than your summer garden. And that's because in the summer, the sun is high, in the winter, the sun is low. So you may have a building or a tree or something in the way that is casting shadow on your absolutely fabulous tomato bed for the summer that isn't so good for the winter. So this is something we just have to experience in our own yards and um, track where the sun is and you know do your best to plant in the sunniest place. Most, most all plants that I know of that are vegetables are gonna want between six and eight um, hours of sunlight, direct sunlight a day. And things that you can get away in the shade in the summer are actually fall crops that do better in full sun in the, in the uh, fall and winter. Then besides the sun situation, you've got other microclimate factors. You've got elevation. Maybe you're up in the mountains and it gets really cold. Maybe you're in a river valley depression and you get a cold sink. Maybe it's cold because you're low or you're high. Maybe you're in a windy place. Maybe you're near the salty sea mist happening. Um, slope, whether it's at an angle and you have a, you know, a rain situation where you might get erosion, that can be an issue. How much rainfall we're gonna get? Oh, please let us get some rain. And, and of course the temperature. So in the olden days, like last year, I would have said, <laughs> Go to the USDA zone map and find out that we are in zone nine, zone nine A or B, depending if you're a sunset gardener. But um, these days, the weather's so wacky that I recommend you get a min max thermometer. And here's one I just got. And my minimum is 50. And this is in my greenhouse. It's not a heated greenhouse. But it was 50 one of these nights, which is bad for my tomatoes that are still not colored up. And it was 117 one afternoon. So temperatures, the ranges, it's good to keep an eye on that. As you're selecting plants, you might think about the thickness of the leaves. If they're really thick, hardy leaves like kale, they're gonna be more frost hardy than something delicate like spinach. And you can see here the spinach is had a little bad frost day, um, or, or um, I'm sorry, lettuce. This is lettuce. Spinach is the same way. So attend to your own microclimate, get a min-max thermometer, cost me about 10 bucks on Amazon, and uh, thicker leaves are hardier in the winter. Let's talk a little bit about soil and what it's made out of and why you should care about it. So it's mostly air and water, 50%. And then it's 45% rock, that's mineral particles. And then the thing that makes it magical, delicious, and good for your plants is organic matter. And that's only about 5%, but it's so, so, so very important. And that's made up of living organisms and roots and broken down organic matter, which is called humus. You cannot um, add enough organic matter in my, in my worldview. <laughs> um, you have to keep adding it uh, every season or every year. It, it kind of goes away. It decomposes and just uh, doesn't do what it's supposed to do any, anymore. Um, but what it does for you is it creates air spaces for the air and water to go in, which allows the roots to be happy, uh, the water to drain better if it's a Thick, heavy soil like clay allows it to retain water if it's a very porous, uh, sandy type soil. Um, it produces sticky compounds that actually improve particle aggregation that is an improvement to the soil structure. So all that makes it easier to work in, to dig in, and for roots to penetrate. Um, organic, well decomposed organic matter can 
correct a bad soil pH and moves it towards neutral. Um, it puts a little bit of carbon back in the soil. How much is a hard question to answer, but you are actually sequestering carbon when you don't dig it and you, and you leave uh, compost in or on the soil. And it can improve the immunity of certain soil-borne diseases. So it's, um, it's an incredible benefit. And then using it on top as a mulch will help you retain water, protect the surface, and reduce your weeds. So all these things. And it's hard to overstate how many uh, bacteria and uh, acetamycete, I can't even say it, fungi, yeast, protozoans, algae, nematodes, so many little critters are in this <laughs> little teaspoon of soil, as many as there are people on the earth, almost used to be, you could say that, now the people are exceeding that. But um, it's those healthy, those little creatures that you're feeding with that compost uh, that makes everything work. Let's talk about fertilizer a little bit. So the best thing to do is get your soil tested and find out what it's got a lot of and what it is deficient in. Mine personally is high in phosphorus and high in potassium. By nature, it just is. And it has almost no nitrogen. So I'm always adding feather meal and stuff like that. Um, you don't want to fertilize too heavily in the fall. That's important because like I said, the plants are going into a slow mode and you don't want them to bust out with lots and lots of leaf when it's just about to freeze down. So you want to be judicious with your fertilization. Um, every time you buy fertilizer, you'll find there's three numbers on it. And if you don't know what those are, it's very confusing. So the uh, first number is N, nitrogen. The second one is P, phosphorus. And the third one is K, potassium. I know it's K for potassium. Why? We don't know. But um, these are macronutrients. And plants also need micronutrients. And there's a bunch of those. Um, we're not going to talk about those today. But if you are, depending on what you're growing, if you're growing, um, if you're growing lettuce, if you're growing a salad garden, then you might want to add some nitrogen because that has leafy green growth is what happens to that. Um, if you are growing something that is flowering, so that I'm not going to give it away. We have a quiz later, but something that has a flower, you would use something with phosphorus, and these are the kind of products that you can find phosphorus in. And potassium is good for um, uh, plant respiration and overall health. So all these are very important. But again, get your soil tested if you can first, and then you'll know what you really need to add. So other tricks this time of year, do not cultivate the soil, meaning dig in it, when it's soaking wet. It will ruin the structure. It will, all those little bonds will just fall apart. And don't do it when it's bone dry either. It should be moist. You till or, or turn the soil only when required. Again, you wanna keep those mycorrhizal fungi, connective tissues uh, happy, and you need to fluff it up only as much as you need to. Don't overdo that. But you need to do it to incorporate some organic material and to weed and to plant, of course. So once a season is good. Uh, don't walk on it. Don't smush it. Keep it covered. And by that, I mean, keep something planted on, on it always, whether it's uh, an intentional plant, a cover crop, or even weeds, just something. And um, if you can't do that, you want to heavily mulch, a couple inches of mulch. And uh, this time of year, you've got leaves falling from trees, so they make a good mulch. Add compost before you plant, pretty much every time you plant. Don't plant the same thing in the same place every year, time after time, and do minimize the use of chemicals, herbicides, fungicides, fertilizers, because they can impede the growth of those little micro creatures, the critters, I say. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna hand this over to Bridget now. All right, let me take a minute to get situated here. Hi, everybody. 
All right, so now we're going to start talking a little bit about what to plant and what would be a good time to do that. Okay, so when we're moving into uh, the fall and winter season, um, what we're going to be looking at is plants that mostly do well in the cooler months and do well with um, sunlight that um, is um, coming to be shorter and shorter as we get um, further and further into fall and winter. And one of the biggest considerations that we want to keep in mind is uh, how we're going to plant that. Are we gonna go ahead and um, start from seed and transplant our seedlings? Are we gonna do direct seeding into the soil? Um, maybe we plan on picking up transplants from our local nursery. And that's important to keep in mind because especially with certain plants um, like brassicas, they need a long time for their seedlings to develop. And if you wanted to grow from seed um, and let's say we're gonna plant sometime in October, you really need to get going on those seed starts now, um, seeding those starts now. Um, Delise has created this really wonderful planting reference guide. She spent a lot of time on it. It's a beautiful piece of work and it's a really great reference for you. I love looking at it and considering it when I am planning out my gardens. And this one um, you'll see up in the top, it's a fall planting guide from seed in Monterey Bay area. And um, if we'll just take the top one, you can look at arugula. Um, and the suggestion there is that it's sown directly into the ground. Days to germination is seven to 14. Approximate um, days to, from seeding to harvest is about 40. And um, months to start seed from, from there is September through May. And then um, you can just go on down through the suggestions and look at what you might want to plant and look it up, you know, kale. Um, kale looks like, oh, well, we could start it from, um, um, by directly sowing it to the ground and or we could start it indoors in a flat and transplant it later. So this is a really great reference for you and probably the, the gem of the class for you today. And you're gonna get it. And um, we'll send it to you after. The class. We'll send it to you after the class. Okay, as we were uh, talking um, shortly a little while ago about was that we're gonna be planting cool season crops and that's a little bit, um, you know, given away in the name. Those are vegetables that like to be grown in the cooler months of the year. And as we're looking at this slide, um, we see a couple things that are standing out to us. First of all, we've got plants uh, divided up into cold hardy crops and semi hardy crops. And what do we mean by that? And what we mean by that, even though it's kind of given away in the name yet again, is cold hardy crops are crops that do well in winter months um, with lower temps and they can withstand frosts if we were to get those over the winter. Semi hardy crops are plants that um, are grown well in the fall and winter months also, um, but they really can only tolerate a light frost and not for too many days in a row. So if we had a spell where we know we were gonna get frost several nights in a row, then you would want to take some protective measures by probably using a frost cover blanket. Um, now we've got some choices here um, between cold hardy and semi hardy of how we're gonna get them started, how we're gonna get them into the ground. And in that top section there, um, we've got some ideas for you that you could start from seed on your own, sowing them into flats. And under cold hardy, we've got some suggestions of broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collards, kohlrabi, um, semi-hardy crops that you could start from seed and flats, artichoke, cilantro, cauliflower, celery, parsley, dill, several suggestions that you can see. And then on the bottom there, um, we've got a section for direct seeding. And um, these are um, 
plants that either need to be direct seeded because they're a root crop and they don't do well as a transplant, or they do well direct seeded into the ground. Um, under the cold hardy, we've got some suggestions like peas and turnips and rutabagas, parsnips. Under semi hardy, we've got um, spinach, some of our lettuce, um, carrots, beets as uh, suggestions there. Then in the middle, we've got um, uh, either in flats or direct seed. So these are some ideas for you that you can make a choice whether or not you want to start them um, in a flat um, or if you want to direct sow them into the ground. Oops. All right, so in this next slide, we're talking um, mostly about planting. Um, when would be the best time? And also we're gonna throw some purchasing tips at you. So the date that I like to have in mind um, for my fall planting is October 15th. Um, garden rules, like all rules, are made to be broken. So of course you can you know, plant a little bit earlier than that, a little bit later than that, but it's a nice goal to have in mind, especially if you're gonna start your own um, seeds. Because as I mentioned a little bit earlier, if you're going to grow some of the brassicas like broccoli and cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, things like that, they really need to be seeded this week um, if you're going to be able to transplant them, you know, by mid-October. And if you don't want to do that, then you'll make a decision that you're going to buy um, your seedlings from a local nursery and transplant them that way. One thing that we like to uh, point out is um, if it comes to um, any plant that has a tap root, and that would be like beets and carrots, rutabagas, turnips, things like that, uh, please don't buy them in a six pack. Uh, root crops don't transplant well. And we um, have really great nurseries in our area full of really knowledgeable, pe knowledgeable people. I learn things from them all the time, but a nursery's um, business is dependent on selling us plants. And when you go into um, the nursery um, to get ready to plant your fall garden, you will see some six packs of root crops. And the problem with that is if you're a novice gardener or maybe you're just trying to grow fall or winter veggies for the first time, um, those most likely won't do well for you. I mean, you might have some magic moments in your garden and the transplants do well, but most likely um, they're probably gonna fail. And then that could lead a new gardener or someone that's trying fall gardening for the first time to think that maybe um, they you know, weren't successful with their garden when really the nursery just set them up to fail. Another thing that we need to keep in mind in our area when we get our seedlings into the ground is that sometimes we can be prone to heat spells in September and October. And you wanna protect your seedlings if that were to happen, because once again, we're growing plants that prefer to be grown in the cool winter months. So one of the best ways to protect that is to make protect your plants is to make sure that you have irrigated them properly um, before the heat wave comes. Heat wave comes, excuse me, and also to provide some shade for them, and that can be as we spoke earlier about the shade cover, um, um, row cover, or sorry, Delise needs to do something. Oh, she's handing me a little a little sample to show you. I, I'm not sure if you can see. Oh, good, you can. Great. Um, it also can um, mean uh, taking your umbrella off your porch and putting it over your um, planter boxes um, if you're using those or over your rows. Sometimes maybe you've got like a tarp laying around and you can attach it to two poles you know, and give your, um, your baby fresh seedlings some shade for a couple hours in the afternoon. So it can look like all kinds of things, but those are the two things that you'd want to do if we get a heat spell. We can't do too much about how hot it's going to be, but we can make sure they're watered properly and that they've got some shade to get through those really intense parts of the day. Can I just say if they're in a container, I put them under a tree? Yeah. And Delise has that in her own backyard. So um, yeah, if um, you've got them in a container, then you have the ability to move them around. Um, so it works well to put them under a tree if you've got a nice one in your yard. All right, so now we're going to move into talking about some different types of vegetables that you might be thinking about growing over the fall and uh, winter months. Um, one of the top families that we like to grow in winter is the brassica family and brassicas are made up of cabbages and mustards. 
And like we said earlier, if you do want to start them from seed, this is the week to do that so that you have a nice healthy seedling by mid-October to transplant. Um, and brassicas are the divas of the fall garden, as a local farmer likes to say, just like uh, tomatoes are the divas of our summer garden. They will take the most time from you and they will need the most care. Um, but they include all of our favorites for fall and winter, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. And a fun little fact is not everybody knows is um, kale is actually a member of the cabbage family. And we've got some little um, snippets here. Um, broccoli is um, a plant that we know when we harvest, we kind of harvest the top head of it. But um, the broccoli will continue to develop side shoots that you can harvest and continue uh, to eat throughout the fall and winter. Cauliflower is a one and done. Once you take that head, that plant is um, done growing for you. Brussels sprouts um, take a lot of care. They're the um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. They take a lot of care. They're going to spend the longest time in the ground and they're finicky and hard to grow. And they are also um, just a major attractor of aphids. Um, I find them a little bit challenging to grow and I prefer to uh, buy my Brussels sprouts at the farmer's market. Um, but if you are going to um, grow them, just know ahead of time that they um, might be a little bit on the challenging side for you. Oops, I keep moving the cursor in the wrong area. Okay, um, alliums are onions and garlic. Um, one thing to keep in mind is alliums will always like a very rich soil and they're heavy on um, nitrogen. Um, in our area, we're um, for the fall season, we're gonna put, um, pick a short day varieties. And um, if you can find them, um, they're really great to grow from plant starts. And we have a photo of them in this slide. Um, sometimes you'll find them in like the little bulb forms. Um, and I find that doesn't uh, work out as well for me. So if I can find the plant starts, that's what I like to grow my onions and, and leeks and shallots from. Um, garlic, um, we're going to give a special mention to because um, garlic um, is in the garden for about nine months. And that's important to take note of because sometimes some of us have limited space in what we're growing in. We might have two garden beds in our backyard. We might just have a couple blanter boxes. Um, and we might not want to give up that real estate to garlic when we know that we want to get our spring veggies in, you know, next April or the beginning of May, um, but we can't because we uh, still have our garlic and we're not going to be harvesting that until July. So that's just something to keep in mind if you want to grow garlic, um, that it's going to be in the soil for a long time and um, it's going to need that real estate to itself for the whole nine months. It's not a great thing to do any interplanting with because it has its own water needs. And when you get close to harvest time, you're going to have to cut the water um, for garlic. So you don't want something planted with it that will still need water. So really, it's just kind of its own sole cop, crop in whatever area of the garden you want it to grow and just know it's going to need a lot of time. Nine months. Leafy greens, this category includes lettuces and spinaches, arugula and different various greens. And one thing to keep in mind um, is that they are frost sensitive. So you might have to take some prote protective measures with them during the growing season. Um, they're very vulnerable to slugs, snails and birds. And Delise talked about that a little bit earlier about how to um, protect from those different pressures. And they are also nitrogen lovers. And um, we've got a couple uh, helpful hints here. Lettuce seed goes dormant when it's really hot. So if you're starting seed um, and it's really hot out, you might wanna bring those trays inside and start them in your house. Um, and this is a nice uh, trick to get spinach to germinate um, as it germinates quickly after three days in the fridge and in between a damp paper towel. And the fun thing about growing greens is that they're pretty quick and they're pretty easy. And um, who doesn't want kale salad and kale soup all winter? <laughs> all right, legumes um, included in this category are peas, um, fava beans, and vetch. 
Um, most PEs will need trellising, so you want to make sure um, you know what that's going to be for you ahead of time and that you have space in your garden for that. There's three kinds of peas, shelling, snow, and sugar snap. A fall heat wave especially can kill um, these seedlings when they're young and vulnerable. So once again, we want to make sure that we have some sort of shade system prepared that we're going to use and that we're um, irrigating them properly um, so that we're prepared for a heat wave. Um, fava and vetch make really great cover crops and if you enjoy fava beans and what it takes to process them then it's kind of a two for one. You get a really great cover crop out of it plus favas. Root crops, carrots, beets, uh, rutabagas, turnips, um, like we said earlier, we're always going to direct sow them into the soil because they're a tap root and tap roots don't um, do well with transplanting. Um, they come in all kinds of beautiful colors. They're delicious and gophers love them as much as we do. So that will be a challenge for you. Um, once you get them directly sown into the soil, you'll need to thin them, th excuse me, you'll need to thin them. And um, your seed packets will let you know what kind of distance it wants. It's typically about an inch. And when you have those seedlings, um, don't toss them um, because um, they're delicious in your salads and soups or a nice treat for chickens if you have them. Um, so we've got some tips on this slide too. Um, it's a really nice to um, mix your carrot seed with some sand um, to help you um, evenly distribute the seed as you're going down your row or inside your um, growing container. And um, to keep uh, seeds uh, moist, um, just covering them with a wet newspaper helps to keep them moist and helps them germinate. So now we have come to a fun part of our class today. It's a quiz. Um, what plant do you part, um, part of the plant do you eat? Um, that Delise came up with us, came up for us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Denise now because she is gonna run this part of the class for us. Denise, can you launch the poll? There you go. I have launched Thank you. the poll. All right, there's a number of questions here. So scroll down and you just need to uh, choose your answers. What part of the plant do you eat? Can everybody see the poll? Did it come up for you? Can you see it? No, you can't. You don't talk next. There we go. There we go. We're going to give you a few minutes. Don't be shy. <laughs> A lot of leaf eaters we can't, here. <laughs> we can't tell who's given which answer. So go ahead and just make your best guess down. there. All right, folks, we're going to give you one more minute. Oh, come on, only 17 out of 23. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm getting the feeling that you're done. Denise, can you end this poll and show us the results? There you go, whoops. Did oh. that come up for everyone? Okay. Everybody got that right. 100%, yay. <laughs> Scroll down. Yes, you. All right, so we eat the leaf of the lettuce. That makes sense. Broccoli, that's a tricky one. So the correct answer is, drum roll please. 
Flower. Those of you who chose flower were correct. Yep, that's that uh, nubbly part on the top. Rutabaga. Somebody's eating their rutabaga leaves. I think that's probably on purpose, just like you can eat beet greens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but obviously, that's a root or a tuber with a swollen root. But then they get a little harder. Okay, kohlrabi. That was a tough one. This one stumps me. All right. So, what part of the plant do you eat with kohlrabi? We've got all kinds of answers. So, what is it? Well, the 29% of you that chose the stem win the prize. Yay, you get kohlrabi. <laughs> <laughs> and then the hardest one of all, Brussels sprouts. What the heck? Okay, it, it's, it seems like it should be flower in a weird place on the stem, but in fact, it is a modified leaf bud. All right, wanna hit stop sharing there? Okay. And just close the window. Okay. And oh, look, people are writing things in. <laughs> so click um, to the right of the screen. All right. So why do we care um, in terms of how long they are in the ground? Remember um, about light and time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So broccoli, flowers take longer to um to happen and so the broccoli is going to be in the ground longer and it's gonna it's going to be more vulnerable to predation and weather and gophers and every other thing so that's why broccoli is a diva and lettuce you eat the leaf which just pops out really quickly so that's a that's a quick one um roots are pretty pretty they're usually medium i'd say in terms of the the length in the ground um, but they're pretty invulnerable to frost. But oh my gosh, I go for a lesson. So that was our that was our playtime. <laughs> Let's move on. You all did Come very on. well. <laughs> all right. So um, I am going to talk a little bit about watering here. Watering is a really uh, big subject, and we have a whole class dedicated to it. And hopefully, we'll have that again in the spring. Um, but just to give you some things that you might want to think about um, when you're trying to figure out how much should I water, what's too much, what's not enough, it's always a Goldilocks question, and you have to take into all sorts of variables into account. Um, what exactly are you growing? Where are you growing it? Is it a container? Is it in the soil? Um, what's your microclimate? You know, how much wind do you get? And all of these things will determine how much water that you need to give your plants. Um, sometimes in the winter when it's a cold, you know, foggy, cloudy day, we might think that we don't need to water um, when in fact our plants um, are, you know, in need of water. So don't let the weather fool you. You have to check your soil. And the best way to do that is um, to put your hand in the soil and see how it's doing no matter what you're growing in to let you know if you are giving your plants enough water. And one good rule of thumb is that we want to make sure that our water reaches the root zone of whatever we're growing. So if we're growing spinach, then you know we know that we've got like a little tiny root zone below the soil and that we wanna make sure that we get the water you know, down into that root zone and um, you know, the best way to do it, as I said, is, you know, to water a certain amount of time, you know, come by your, your plants and move the soil and see if you've gotten um, to the root zone and that might have been the way you're watering 15 minutes, it might have been 20 minutes, and then you know that's about the time that you need to reach the root zone of that um, particular plant. If you're growing big, huge cabbages, you know, they've got much deeper root zones, so you have to, you um, give that particular plant more water and you're going to want to check that in the same way and make sure that you feel like you're getting the water into the root zone of that plant. Um, and this bottom um, picture is um, something called a leaky pipe. It's a soaker hose and that's a nice way to kind of start out with a drip system and see if you um, enjoy using that. 
Another thing to keep in mind um, in winter, if we do get some wind, is that wind can be very drying because soil and the plants in it. So you might have to water a little bit extra on those windy days. And now I am going to hand it back over to Delise, and she's going to talk to us about protecting our garden. Okay. This might be old news to some of you, so forgive me if it's redundant, or if you've ta taken our pest management classes before. So I'm just going to focus on things that tend to be fall problems. So yellow slugs, earwigs, some caterpillars, gophers, and birds, but only at certain times of the year. So with the integrated pest management, there are some major categories um, of, of things you can do that um, are broken into chunks. This is um, one of them, cultural. So when I say cultural, what I mean is how you treat the, the plant, um, how you modify the environment, and what sort of plants you choose. So those are cultural things. So here we have um, a messy pile of brush, and that is just a great micro city for slugs, snails, and airwaves, and probably rats, and, and maybe bunny rabbits, and all kinds of things could live in that. So one of the first things you want to do at the end of summer, as you're pulling up all your plants, is um, is to deal with the trash, is to take away the big um, habitats that you're producing with piles of sticks and shrubbery. Another cultural thing is uh, sanitizing your tools. You can transfer diseases from one plant to another. So that would be in a, ble a bleach solution or using alcohol wipes, which everybody seems to have these days. Another big category is exclusion. How do you keep the, the predator, I mean, sorry, the insect or the uh, pest away from the plant? And that's through some kind of barriers. And this is a lot of different kinds of barriers for different situations. Um, the kind that we're gonna be talking about today might include uh, row covers and under, underwire and netting. Those are the things that would apply to a fall garden. And then another category is mechanical. Um, that would include hand picking, um, trapping, um, washing with a hard stream of water, like you would do on aphids. And uh, weeding is actually a mechanical control of weeds. So I've given you the, the, big, the big three here um, with links to, and I'm gonna show the cabbage worm. Uh, this is those little, butterflies with a dot and they fly around in late summer and early fall when it's still warm and they lay their eggs on the underside of preferably brassica or cabbage family plants that's their favorite though they're not that discriminating um, so we're linking to this ucipm website and i have a link for each one of them and it will give you information on what to do about them but the cabbage worm is, is really only a problem when the plant is really, really tiny. Um, and that's when you're planting it out. So um, a, a cabbage worm infestation of larva can just chew to a skeleton um, your transplants. So that's something to keep an eye on. And you can either look under, under the leaves on a regular basis and squish them with your fingers, or you can pre prevent that with um, a cover, a row cover and do the exclusionary thing. Earwig, slugs, and snails. Um, everybody probably knows about what to do with slugs and snails. People like to say beer. I never, I never can do beer traps. They don't work for me. Um, so what I recommend for both of those is first you identify what it is. Is it a slug, a snail, or an earwig that's chewing your leaves? Um, you go out there at night with a flashlight about 10 o'clock at night, and you just pick them off with your hands and put them in a bucket of soapy water. And that will, um, if you do that for four or five nights, you will, you will pretty much wipe out the population for the season. And that's my, that's my favorite way to deal with slugs and snails. Earwigs are a little trickier. It's hard to get your hands on them. So those 
uh, are good with traps, or you can use, um, it's an organic certified product. It's called Sluggo Plus, and it will, it will kill and they will eat slugs and snails and earwigs will eat it and they will die. So that's the fail safe method. And it won't hurt your cats and your dogs and birds. Sow bugs are gonna show up too, also known as pill bugs, and they are not so much of a pest. They eat the compost, they eat decaying ve vegetation, they eat already damaged material on the plant, but uh, rarely will they go for live living um, plant material, but sometimes they do, but usually not. So don't worry so much about that. Here's the guy you gotta worry about. Gophers can, um, you know, they kind of wait for your plant to be big and juicy and almost ready to harvest and then they take it down. So it's good to know a mole from a gopher and a mole, um, it has a large territory. It eats grubs, it disturbs the soil surface um, and makes that kind of trail in the lawn. It likes, it likes moist soil. And frankly, they're cosmetically damaging and sometimes they can push a plant out of the way, but uh, they're not eating plants. And so I just leave them alone. They're kind of you know, cultivating my soil. Voles are also known as field mice, and they look just like little mice with short tails. And they're only a problem when they're in large, large populations. So I'm not going to speak to the moles and the voles today, but I am going to talk to you about gophers. We do have these links if you want to know more about them. So exclusion is the proactive way to go about it, and that would be uh, putting a net or doing a gopher wire under basket. That's a physical exclusion. There are no cultural uh, approaches. There are no plants that gophers won't eat, as far as I can tell, with a possible exception of daffodils, because they are poisonous. But you, you know, I've even tried lining a bed with daffodils or narcissus bulbs. They go right under them. They don't care. So physical exclusion, meaning underground wiring uh, of a whole bed, this can be expensive. Uh, you need to use the right material, hardware cloth, not chicken wire. And you have to be aware that within mm, four to five years, it's probably going to rot and they're going to find ways in and it's just going to be business as usual for the gopher. So I use traps and there are a number of different kinds of traps. Uh, you're very lucky if you can find a gopher snake um, or if there's some other kind of predators that come and eat your gophers. I have a next door cat who's a beautiful animal and a, and a great hunter. And I've seen him cruising away with a little gopher in his mouth once or twice. So that's a good thing to have, but it's not gonna take out the population. So here's some tips on trapping a gopher. This is a gopher 101, really basic. First, you have to find the run. That's the hard part. And the run is this lateral run, or it's this uh, sort of horizontal line um, along the, the middle of the screen here where the gopher is looking up with a flower in its mouth. Mm -hmm. And the way you find it is you look for some disturbed area, you look for some gopher evidence. It's usually a crescent shaped mound with a little hole that's capped with soil. And you start poking, you know, six inches to a foot around that disturbed area with some kind of big poker. And I'm showing you my wonderful poker thing that's the best the best part of a different gopher trap that the gopher trap that I bought that came with this broke immediately. So that was called a gopher hawk. Um, and I don't use that anymore, but I use something called a gophinator. So we'll see some more about that. So once you've identified that there is, you know, you push down and boom, it gives, you know that you've hit some air under the ground. Uh, I usually dig with a trowel make sure that I've found the right place, try to get it coming and going both directions. And then I bring a, a post hole digger to you know, dig up the least amount of soil possible and just uh, pull a couple of chunks of soil out so I can get at that hole. And then I set my directions in both, or set my traps in both directions and uh, stake them. So here is a gophinator. 
And there is a video. This is a Maccabee trap. This is a cinch trap. These are box traps. And here's the gofinator. And it's a little tricky to, to set. Once you know how to do it, get the muscle memory, it's easy. But it takes a little practice. So you can watch this video on how to set it. Um, when you set it, you always wear your gloves. Very, very important. Any trap, you always want to wear gloves for that. It's not about the smell as much as your fingers. <laughs> and um, then you put one in going each direction and you want, you want it to be staked. Now this is important. You stake with a string, the gofinator, and you stick it in the ground so that when the poor little creature gets snapped, it can sometimes live for a little while and, and try and drag the whole thing down into its uh, layer, and then you'll lose your $15 gofinator. So stake them. Birds can be a pest that you can do very little about. You can cover the plants with a floating row or with bird netting. And they're really, uh, it's really important to do this with very young seedlings or even a, a planted seed bed. Because in the fall, they start getting hungry. I don't know why. They get hungrier in the fall and they are doing a migration pattern. So there's, there seems to be more birds in the fall. And they will just go after all your seedlings and pick them right out of the ground. So it's good to uh, just cover it, like I said, with floating row, which is a, a light fabric that you can buy at the garden store. Um, and protect them for that time that they're very vulnerable. After that, you're probably good. Uh, they also eat insects and slugs and snails, so you got to weigh the pros and cons, birds. And they are protected from harm by fishing game. Most, most wild birds are, so you can't shoot them. can't live with them. can't live without them. And here's some more info on how to deal with birds. Here's the IPM website, Integrated Pest Management is what that stands for. And you can go to it here. And when you go there, you go to home, home and garden. There's four sections. There's a lot for, for farmers too. And if you know what the plant is, but you don't have any idea what the problem is, you can browse by plant and it will tell you the kind of pests that affect it. If you think you know what the pest is and you wanna make sure, you can go this way. And this diagnostic tool is really clever. Um, it asks you a series of questions that you answer and then it, it's a decision tree that will take you take you to the solution. Okay, we're going to talk about planning for spring. <laughs> and here comes Bridget. <laughs> All right, so tonight we have um, been speaking about growing some fall and winter veggies. Um, but this time of year is also a good time to think about just planning what you might want to do next spring. Um, and you might want to concentrate in the fall and winter season on just doing that and not growing fall veggies, or you might want to do half and half. You know, if you've got a couple beds, maybe you want um, some of them with fall veggies, maybe you want the other ones with cover crop getting ready for your spring planting. If you choose um, to uh, not grow veggies in your soil and you decide that you want to do winter cover crops instead, um, these are some reasons that you would want to do it. Um, cover cropping protects your soil, it fixes nitrogen, it encourages soil, it encourages soil microbes, it breaks up hard soil, it suppresses weeds, it adds biomass, and it protects all of the hard work that you've been putting into creating nice, rich, healthy soil for your plants. And you don't want to lose that to wind and um, possible rain erosion if we get some rain this winter. And I used to work for a farmer that liked to joke that Mother Nature doesn't like to expose her undergarments. And um, that has always stuck with me. Um, so even if you choose not to do a winter cover cropping for whatever reason, even though that would uh, be a really wonderful thing for your soil, um, at least um, uh, protect your beds or your containers with a heavy layer of mulch. And like Delise had said earlier, right now, you know, it can be as simple as collecting the leaves that are falling off your trees 
throwing some straw down, um, maybe some wood chip mulch if you have that, but your, your best choice really would be um, for your soil and for your next garden is to plant a cover crop. Um, there are all kinds of uh, different cover crops to choose from. We were speaking a little bit earlier about fava beans. That's a nice cover crop because you get a cover crop and the fava beans. Um, bell beans are a wonderful choice. They um, um, really help to fix nitrogen in the soil. And then we've got some different categories here, uh, different uh, names of um, cover crops, excuse me, hairy vetch, um, Austrian peas, winter rye, Kodiak mustard, and a soil builder mix. The cover crop I use is just um, something that I get from Johnny Seeds and it comes and it's already mixed up and it usually has some sort of field pea in it, some sort of grass like a rye, and then usually like a fava bean or a bell bean. And that way you get all the goodies in your cover crop all at once um, when you use a mix. Um, this is a quick um, just slide on what you would do um, if you wanted to plant a cover crop. So let's say you're working, this is obviously in the soil, not in, um, you know, like a garden box or a container, but you've uh, planted your cover crop, um, you've watered it and you let it grow and you're getting close to wanting to plant again in um, the next spring season. So you would chop it down, turn it in um, to your soil and wait three weeks before you um, plant. Um, also, you could come through with um, a machete or maybe a spade and cut the greens off and set that aside to make nice compost pile with and um, just let uh, the roots of the plant rest um, for a, a few weeks before you plant into it. Um, these are some um, great ways um, to condition your soil um, through straw bell, straw bell gardening or lasagna gardening. Uh, Delise used to teach a class on straw bell gardening, which is a great class. I'm not sure if we'll have that again next spring if you we will, do. You will have it this November, I think. Oh, good. We're going to yeah. have it in November. Yeah. It's also a, a good way um, to get rid of grass in your lawns and to start moving more towards growing food, not, not lawns. Um, January and February are great months um, to make yourself a cup of chai tea or whatever you prefer and get in the hot tub and start um, perusing your seed catalogs and start um, deciding what it is that you might want to grow come, come the spring. Because um, the winter months don't necessarily always have to be about growing. Um, it's a great time to just take a break, uh, get your gardens under some cover crop and rest and just decide what it is that you want to grow next season in the spring. All right, um, we have come to the end of our presentation and we're now ready for questions and I think we'll try to sit next to each other. Yeah. And um, try to take some questions. So Denise is gonna tell us whatever you want. And then Denise right. is gonna let us know. Okay, so we'll just start at the top here. A couple of these might've been You're covered muted, as- no. Theoretically, I'm hmm. not. Can you hear we me now? I can't hear you, so let me play with that. All right. Keep talking. Okay. Um, I think it's my speaker. Some of, some of these might have been answered oh, toward, oh, other people can hear me. All right, we're good. Yeah, no, it's me. It's my mic. It's my speaker. <laughs> so. All right. <laughs> Go for it. All right, now we're good? Yeah. All right, okay. So our first question was about um, an apple tree with codling moth. Um, can those fallen leaves be used as some of the compost that you were discussing earlier? Ew. I, I think they... I think they overwinter in the ground. Right? Yeah, I, I, that um, wouldn't be something that I would choose to do. I, I, I think that might be uh, kind of dicey to play with coddling moss. I would probably send that off in my in my greens bucket. Or you could compost it and uh, make it as hot of a compost as you can. Yeah, I and mean, if you're going to do that, you have to make sure that you monitor it and that you do do a hot compost pile and that you've got it hot enough to kill anything that would be in there. All right. All right. Uh, looking for some tips on why seedlings might be leggy or simply not growing, sort of becoming stagnant. 
light. They're reaching for the light. <laughs> uh, that's usually the reason for leggy seedlings. Um, sometimes they outgrow their little nutrients that came along with the seed and they need a little boost. So I would put it in bright, bright light, either artificial lights if it's the wrong time of year or dappled sunlight this time of year um, and give them a little shot of fish emulsion. Do you agree with that? I totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, how about thoughts about using reclaimed water for veggies? Using reclaimed water for veggies. You, want me to you can to... handle this one. Okay. <laughs> reclaimed water. There are rules about these things. Um, you are not supposed to water. Uh, use gray water on vegetable crops that touch the water. So you wouldn't want to do it with, you, you want to do it with a fruit tree, but you don't necessarily want to do it with lettuce. You don't want to do it with spinach. You don't do, do it with anything that's going to splash onto the plants uh, for human health reasons. Um, and when you say reclaimed, do you mean an actual, um, gray water system or are you talking about the water in your shower that you catch before it gets hot so that would right. be a thought well, i water i water my whole garden with shower water but i don't have a gray water system because um too many rules <laughs> <laughs> all right uh this was reclaimed from the water district that was specifically for that one I don't know what that means. So that's reclaimed through the through the water processing. Um, no, they probably have like system. a system set up in their house. That's what I'm thinking. Okay, so you might want to no, take that question to the to the master gardener uh, hotline. We have somebody who's an expert on reclaimed water, and mm -hmm. she can help you out. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. it's. It's water offered, uh, the water district offers free reclaimed water. It's non, let's see, is that right? Non potable. No knowledge. Wish I knew more. Want some free water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Any specific type of soil for beets or carrots? Same for both. Uh, nitrogen rich. Same for both. Um, uh, the main thing is the texture. You want it loose and friable so they don't get all hung up on rocks and, and curly. You know how carrots can get all wiggly wonkly. <laughs> so um, in terms of their nutrient needs, it's not high nitrogen. I would say um, it's more of a potassium lover. What do you think? I agree with that. But a balanced fertilizer. And you want to start, um, if you're starting from scratch, you'd want to start with just a really good um, veggie mix if you're starting from scratch. Yeah, that's a balanced NPK fertilizer mix that you can find in any nursery. All right, just a couple more that we have here. Um, one was sort of covered a little bit after the question came in, but uh, maybe a specific uh, mention of this. Um, let's see. Uh, one of our uh, gardeners has red clover in one of their beds. Uh, should that be dug in uh, as the, you know, cover crop or you sort of covered that after, after this came up? Mm -hmm. Is that a perennial? Um, well, it really depends on um, what you want to do with the bed. If you plan on planting this fall, then yeah, I would dig it in. And because um, sometimes clovers are used as cover crops and um, get it ready for planting. If you aren't going to plant this fall, then I would just uh, leave it until spring. I don't think red clover does well in the cooler weather, though. I would be more. That's a good point more prone to dig it in. Um, I, some of the clovers are, are perennial. You can, you can just uh, keep them for years and most of them are annuals. So I would, again, recommend the hotline uh, and or I'm happy to do a little research and get back to you. 
All right. Um, okay. So there uh, seems to be a wood and root eating pest in a raised bed. Uh, they've been having trouble uh, finding any solutions on the IPM website. So any thoughts about who might be causing this damage? <laughs> so what kind of wood is being eaten? Explain that. You can unmute. Uh, Andrea or Andrea, uh, if you're still here. Andrea, unmute yourself and tell us what you mean. Yeah. Oh, old rotten wood. Mm, so you can see teeth marks in it? It's chewing on wood? Let's see. That was what placed. So it was placed in the bed? Well, I would think... You must have beavers. <laughs> uh, rats might be chewing wood, but they wouldn't be chewing the roots. And what are the roots of? What What is the root? What's the plant? Rhubarb. Uh, sounds mm. gopher-ish. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. That's gopher-esque. The um, best way to find out is to take a probe, like one of those one foot long weeders, those straight weeders that works. Um, just find something, even a hoary hoary knife, just poke it in the ground until you think you can feel a tunnel and set a trap and see what you catch. And hmm. I mean, sometimes things get complicated and it, it could be two things. It could be something's after the wood and something's after the plants so yeah that's a possibility too so it was triple wired last winter you say mm. well wow. gophers have the way they do have the ability to go over mm -hmm. over and in it can happen a camera brilliant susan great idea <laughs> so for not too much money you can get those wildlife hunt designed for hunting cameras and just keep an eye on the plant at night that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. All you right. Did see, so, wait, wait, wait. I, I love this question. Oh. You saw a vole on a game cam? Hmm. Then you're asking us the question you know the answer to, it sounds like. Because <laughs> a vole will definitely eat the roots of a rhubarb. We'll go um, over and under. It goes all kinds of ways. They they travel above ground as well as below ground. Um, so it could be that you have voles. And that's just a mouse trap. You use a regular house mouse trap. You look for a little, look for their little hole in the ground, which is about an inch. Um, and then it, there's sort of a run where they come in and out of, they always come the same pathway. So they, they make a little, a little ditch that they run through. And that's where you would put the mouse trap. There you go. All right. Uh, <laughs> it looks like there are lots of things going on with this rhubarb here. So I'm not sure if you're looking at the chat too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Um, so one other uh, question here um, on a different subject, uh, talking about tomatoes, since they are known to have uh, issues uh, once they're done, should they dispose of the soil in a container garden sanitize the pots and refill with new potting medium before moving on to another crop or to tomatoes next year, by the way. That sounds like a very conservative and fastidious approach. Yes. That way you're sure not to uh, propagate any fusarium or verticillium wilts in the soil. All right. So far, that's all the, that's all the questions we have. So unless anything pops up very quickly. Once we got through that quick. I want to mention one thing about onions. We went through onions and garlic pretty quick. So garlic's in the ground. Think about how long that is, nine months. If you, if you plant it in November, and there will be a garlic class at uh, the UCSC Farm and Garden, that's going to be free and online like this. So if you're interested in garlic, you might want to look at that. Um, but 
if you plant in November, you're not going to harvest it till June or July. So that's a long time in the ground. And I usually reserve just a little square because there's nothing as good as fresh garlic. It's really wonderful to grow. And it's um, really quite easy after you get it, you get it going. Um, but onions, I said onions. Mm -hmm. So day length sensitive, that's mm -hmm. the thing about onions. What you will find at the groceries at the uh, garden store is you'll find a little six pack with a little like they look like grass with little onion starts in them. Those are good. You can start with that. It's probably too late to start onions now in this area from seed. But if you did go from seed or you bought online in a catalog, you you definitely want to get the short day length or at the very least the medium. But you don't long the, want the long day length. So uh, that's for northern latitudes. And if you get those, you will get flowers before you get bulbs. So just a little extra on onions. One thing that's fun about onions on just like a little fun fact is um, the, the flower color of an onion will um, reflect in the bulb color. So that's fun. That fun <laughs> fun fact. fact for you. <laughs> So do we have any more questions? We have a little bit more time if there's any more questions. <laughs> I have a question. This is Susan. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, you were talking about pests and I understand that everybody here in California has gopher problems and I have uh, them too. And I would love to grow a few things in the ground. Are onions and garlic, do they repel gophers? No, my dear, just the opposite. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> okay, well. I was hopeful there for a moment. <laughs> Thank you. Whoever figures out what the plant is that will repel gophers will be a gazillionaire. <laughs> yep, there are a lot of plants that say they repel gophers, but they don't. Let's uh, talk about future classes on the next slide. Okay, the survey link here in the presentation is wrong. <laughs> Denise is going to put it in the chat right now. So we'd really like to know how we, we, we always like to continually improve. So we ask for your, your feedback. And we also ask in that survey, what would you like to see us teach? So thank you for filling that out. The other thing that's gonna happen soon is you're gonna get within a few weeks email from the California Master Gardener Program, and they're gonna give you a different survey. And the gist of that survey is, did you learn what you learned? Did you use what you learned in that class that you took? And uh, this is a way that they get funding and that funding helps us exist. So we recommend that you definitely answer that email when it comes in. And then later in September, we've got some great classes coming up. We've got drought tolerant perennials um, later in october we're also going to have native plants which are drought tolerant perennials as well um, but uh, this drought tolerant perennials will be by a former board member at the arboretum he's also a master gardener he's also an expert on growing plants for hummingbirds and he'll talk about the exotics so south african and uh, you know, Mediterranean plants from all over the world, as opposed to the California natives. So we're going to have a great class on each of those for our drought ridden state. And then on the 29th, we have a master gardener who has young children and she has created this amazing fairyland of places where children can play and she can have a beautiful, robust garden. So um, tricks like, you know, the bean teepee, we've all seen that. There's a little mud kitchen. Uh, there's a pathway that kids can ride bikes in a circle. It's just really creative what she's done. And anybody that has small children or grandchildren and they wanna do a little gardening uh, as habitat for kids, 
that I, is highly recommended. And then we're having our famous fall plant sale in the fall, <laughs> in October as well. Uh, that will be a no, uh, no contact situation. You will order online. You'll say the day that you want to pick them up. And they are picked up in, um, in Salinas, at our greenhouses in Salinas. So it's a little drive to get there, but we really appreciate you supporting the Master Gardeners. And you'll get some amazing plants. Very unusual varieties you can't find everywhere, including some of those drought tolerant perennials. <laughs> I I see a question on um, worm composting and um, that Dara um, likes to make it into a compost tea and asked for any tips on harvesting and is it ever really worm free? Um, well, you know uh, the the best way to harvest um, from your worm bins is to um, dump out your castings and kind of make like little triangle piles of them of, along a tarp. And the worms that are in the top are gonna try to get away from the sun and they're gonna burrow down into the castings. And then you can come along and just scrape those up and put them in a bucket. And then, then the next, once that's exposed, they're gonna go down further. And so it's a process. Um, you do have to be careful uh, of, you know, drowning your worms because you don't want to make worm compost tea with your precious worms that are doing such good work for you. But that's the most effective way is to um, have the light be your friend. Um, but it is um, time consuming for sure. And hard to make sure that we don't have any of our worm friends um, with our castings that we've harvested. Oh, good. And there will be veggie starts at the plant sale. Yes. Um, I didn't mention that I think they're still taking applications. If you'd like to become a master gardener, oh, yes. uh, there's a link to the 2022 class that you can apply. You need to be interviewed. It's highfalutin, um, but it's a limited number of people and you get college level horticulture education for six months and then you're set loose on the public. <laughs> <laughs> to volunteer like this. <laughs> okay, right. any question, any time. Last chance. I think you guys want dinner. All right. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Denise. Or thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Delise. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope you went away with some um, things that will benefit you for your fall veggie garden uh, plans. And do use the hotline at mbmg.org to uh, ask any questions we didn't answer. And I'm talking to you, Ms. Rhubarb. <laughs> 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 all right. Thanks, all. Thank you. See you next time.